Attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Advances in AFM Technology for Microbiological Research. Uh, my name is Ben Oler. I'm a product manager here at Brooker Nanosurfaces Division. Uh, presenting today will be Dr. Andrea Slade. She's one of our staff biologists here at Brooker working on new AFM technology and applications uh, for the life sciences. Uh, before we get started, I just want to make a couple notes about the webinar uh, logistics. Uh, so during the webinar, if you have any questions, please feel free to just type those into the questions panel uh, of the webinar interface. And then after uh, Dr. Slade finishes her presentation, uh, we'll answer as many of those questions as time allows. Uh, if we don't get to your question, uh, please be assured that we will get uh, in contact with you uh, offline. Uh, if you have any difficulty uh, viewing the webinar today or uh, the webinars that are in it, uh, we will be recording the webinar, uh, and you'll be able to view that from our webinar archive page. Uh, a link for that will be given uh, at the end of the presentation and then also in an email to you uh, after the webinar. And then finally, uh, at the end of the webinar, uh, you'll see an option to participate in a brief survey uh, about the webinar. Uh, I encourage you to please just take a moment to uh, complete that survey. It's very uh, short. Uh, but it helps us a lot in helping choose uh, future topics for webinars that will be both uh, relevant and interesting to you. Uh, so with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Andrea Slade. Thanks, Ben. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. I'm excited to show you some of the um, uh, examples of applications and research that people have been doing in um, microbiology with AFM. Um, so to get started, um, over the past few years, AFM has increasingly been used to study um, both the structural and physical properties of various microorganisms, such as bacteria, fungi, and viruses. Now, there are several advantages to using AFM in this study. While the majority of traditional biological techniques used to study microbial cells are based on ensemble average measurements, AFM is a single molecule technique. This actually allows researchers to examine single molecules or single cells in bio complex biological systems and allows them to gain insights into properties and events that would otherwise be missed in a population-based measurement. ASM is conducted on the native sample surface and requires no staining, labeling, or coding of the surface that might alter the native structure and hence influence interpretation of experimental results. And ASM is also capable of operating in a fluid environment. This allows in situ observation of the effects of changing environmental conditions such as pH, ionic strength, or looking at the addition of drugs, proteins, or other small molecules on a sample. In today's presentation, I'll briefly discuss the typical sample preparation requirements for studying microbial cells by AFM, followed by some examples of application areas in which AFM has had an impact in microbiological studies. And then I will present the latest advances in Bruker AFM technology and discuss how they are introducing new avenues of research. The most important requirement in sample preparation for AFM studies, especially when conducted in fluid, is that the sample specimen be sufficiently immobilized on a suitable substrate so that it's not distorted or dislodged by the lateral motion of the scanning tip. For excised native membranes or reconstituted model membranes, this is typically achieved by simple physical absorption of the membranes to a flat substrate like mica, glass, or silicon in the presence of appropriate electrolytes in the buffer system. Immobilization of live cells for AFM studies, however, is a little more challenging. Simple absorption onto a substrate, such as that used for membranes, is typically insufficient to prevent cell detachment during imaging. Now, while some researchers conduct AFM studies of microbial cells in air by rinsing the cells and allowing them to dry, the cell surface undergoes changes during the dry process that can have potentially um, structural artifacts introduced in the sample and therefore must be considered in interpreting the results of the studies carried out under these conditions. Now, to maintain the viability of microbial cells, immobilization strategies must be non-destructive. The most commonly used and effective methods of immobilizing cells for fluid imaging are mechanically trapping cells in a porous membrane with the membrane having pores of comparable size to the cell. Um, however, while this method works well for spherical cells, it's not as effective for rod-shaped microbial cells. Another commonly used method of immobilization that works for both spherical and rod-shaped cells is to use electrostatic interactions to hold the cells in place on the substrate. This is achieved by coating mica or glass with either polylysine or gelatin doped with chromium sulfate. This creates a positively charged biocompatible substrate to which the negatively charged cells are attracted. 
ASM has been repeatedly and successfully applied to resolving the structure of microbial cell surface layers made of two-dimensional protein crystals with submolecular resolution. Here we show some examples of these types of structures as observed by ASM. The first is bacterial S layers. An S layer is a self-assembled layer of identical proteins or glycoproteins that's associated with the surface of this bacterial cell membrane. While the S layer plays a role in various cellular functions, as the outermost layer of bacteria, its essential function is the mechanical or chemical protection of the cell. The ASM image shown here reveals the organization of the S layer as a two-dimensional crystalline lattice, with the lateral spacing of the individual protein molecules measured at 18 nanometers. The photosynthetic purple membrane has also been extensively studied by AFM. This early AFM image shown here in the center of the slide reveals the hexagonal symmetry of the lattice structure as well as the trimeric organization of the bacteria rhodopsin protein molecules with well-resolved central pores. In a third example, the two-dimensional crystal structure of the aquaporin OMPF or OMPF was examined. Aquaporins are membrane channels that regulate the flow of water in and out of the cell. Here, AFM imaging revealed the trimeric structure of the pore molecules having three-fold symmetry. In addition to static imaging of cell surface layers, AFM has also been able to detect single molecule conformational changes within these structures. In this example here, shown in the slide, researchers used AFM to obtain high-resolution images of the hexagonally packed intermediate, or HPI, layer of Deinococcus radiodurans. The HPI layer is, in actual fact, a type of bacterial S layer. Averaged images, shown in the upper right corner, clearly show the six individual subunits of the hexagonally packed protein molecules in which the central pore is also evident and exhibits two types of conformational states, closed, where we see a central plug, or open, where this plug is absent. Interestingly, researchers observed that continuous imaging um, of the HPI layer they saw that the, some of the pores were actually switched between open and closed states, as indicated in the two consecutive images here. Captured five minutes apart from each other, we see that pores outlined by circles switched from an open conformation to a closed conformation, while in the same image, some pores outlined in squares switched from closed to opened. Now, ASM is currently the only technique that can image the surface of a living cell at high resolution and in real time. The left image here on this slide is that of Streptomyces coelicolor, a vegetative hyphae. Here we can see that a newly developing branch is emerging from the main hyphae on the left-hand side of the image. A remarkable feature revealed by AFM is the presence of an extracellular matrix surrounding the hyphae that is deposited onto the underlying glass substrate as the hyphae grow. As the hyphae spread out over the surface of a food source, they not only anchor the cells to the surface, but they also act to digest and absorb nutrients that are essential to cell growth. The image on the right side of the slide is that of multiple Salmonella typhimurium cells that are encapsulated in a protective layer of extracellular polymetric substances, or EPS. These EPS structures are often associated with the formation of biofilms, and here researchers were using AFM to help study the structure and the function of the EPS structures for pathogenic bacterial species such as salmonella that cause food poisoning. Phase images allowed them to visualize details of the cell surface in the flagella as well as the interactions of the cells within the surrounding EPS, which they were unable to see in the topography data channel. The ability to conduct real-time imaging of live cells is revolutionizing the current views of cell surface dynamics. In the study shown here, AFM imaging was used to monitor the structural dynamics of a single Aspergillus fumigatus conidia spore during germination. The conidia were mechanically trapped in a porous membrane and studies were conducted at 37 degrees Celsius. A. fumigatus is an opportunistic pathogen that is known to be responsible for causing several different respiratory diseases. The outer surface of the Aspergillus conidia are known to be coated in clusters of proteinaceous microfibrils called rodlets. These rodlets are actually composed of molecules called hydrophobins, where actually, which are a family of small hydrophobic proteins. This hydrophobic character of the conidia surface may be involved in several functions that are um, you know, critical to for spore functioning, including adhesion to host cells, dispersion by air currents, and protection of the spores against other chemicals and proteins. The germination of the conidia is known to be associated with a loss of this hydrophobic character. 
This ASM study is the first time that dynamics of these changes in the cell wall structure that occur during their germination were observed in real time and at high resolution. The images on the left-hand side of the slide show changes in the gross morphology of the cell during germination. We can see that there's significant swelling of the conidia as it protrudes more and more from the pore over a span of 120 minutes. High-resolution imaging conducted on the surface of a single conidia spore during germination are shown on the right-hand side of the slide. At 0 to 60 minutes, we clearly see the crystalline structure of the rodlets. Dramatic changes in the cell surface structure were observed after about two hours germination, corresponding to the swelling conidia in the left-hand images. At this time, the rodlet layer begins to transform into a layer of amorphous material. This is in agreement with previous structural and chemical studies, which suggest that disruption of the rodlet layer during germination reveals the inner spore walls that are composed mainly of hydrophilic polysaccharides. Not only can ASM be used to examine cell surface layers at high resolution, it can also be used to investigate the physical properties of these surfaces. In the same study as shown in the previous slide, researchers used AFM probes that were functionalized with a hydrophobic self-assembled monolayer to probe the local hydrophobic character of the conidia spore surface, and to use these probes to monitor their changes in the hydrophysicity during germination. Adhesion maps of the conidia surface were produced by performing force curve measurements with the hydrophobic AFM probe in a two-dimensional array across the spore surface, with each pixel in the adhesion image representing a single force curve measurement. Stronger adhesion forces are observed as lighter colored regions in the adhesion map and represent areas of hydrophobicity. We see that at the beginning of the germination process, the spore surface is highly hydrophobic, corresponding to a surface coated in rodlets. As the germination process continues, the adhesion map becomes remarkably darker, indicating a loss of hydrophobicity. After about two hours, the surface appears to have small passes, patches of hydrophobicity surrounded by a matrix of hydrophilic character, again corresponding to the disruption of the rodlet layer and appearance of the underlying hydrophilic polysaccharide-rich spore wall. In addition to functionalizing AFM probes with self-assembled monolayers, other research groups have successfully modified probes with small molecules or ligands. Similar to the previous study, researchers then take these ligand-modified AFM probes and conduct adhesion mapping across the surface containing molecules or receptors that bind to the ligand on the AFM tip. These adhesion maps represent specific binding interactions between the tip and the surface and allow spatial mapping of the distribution of these binding sites. The following study is an example of this type of molecular recognition mapping or imaging. Bacterial pathogens are known to bind to the surface of cells via um, bacterial adhesion molecules and host cell surface receptors. In the case of mycobacterium tuberculosis, binding to epithelial cells is mediated through the heparin binding hemagglutinin adhesin, or HBHA, which binds to heparin sulfate receptors on the epithelial cells. In this particular study, researchers used AFM to address two important questions. Firstly, what are the forces involved in this binding process? And then, how are the adhesin molecules distributed across the surface of the bacterial cell? To address this, two types of experiments were conducted. First, four spectroscopy experiments were conducted between HBHA-modified AFM tips and heparin-modified gold substrates. Researchers found two significant populations, one at about 53 piconewtons and the other at about 110 piconewtons. Researchers believe this bimodal distribution represent the interaction between one HPHA molecule or two or dimeric forms of HPHA molecules. In the second experiment, heparin-modified tips were used to map the distribution of uh, HPHA molecules across the bacterial cell surface. In the adhesion map, shown at the bottom right-hand um, corner, Lighter areas represent higher binding forces between the ligand-modified tip and the cell surface, which should correspond to the location of the HPA molecules. As we can see here, it was found that adhesins appear to be arranged in nanodomains on the cell surface. As we've seen, modification of AFM probes with uh, self-assembled monolayers or single molecules, such as proteins or ligands, can provide valuable insights into the physical properties of microbial cell surfaces. However, these studies are limited to the properties of the molecules attached to the tip. In a recent study, researchers were able to successfully mobilize a single bacteria cell on an AFM probe. 
These probes can enable greater variety in the way that substrates are introduced and open up our opportunities to examine the interaction of single cell modified tips with biocompatible surfaces or other cells, which has important implications in biofilm interactions. To capture a single bacteria cell on the tip, researchers use an amino acid um, dihydroxyphenylalanine, otherwise known as DOPA, which is secreted by muscles. This methodology showed significant improvements over traditional glutaraldehyde methods, which is known to alter the structure of surface groups on the outer cell membrane and has a large impact on the viability of cells. They were also able to show that cells immobilized using DOPA remained viable for two hours, which implies that cells should stay alive for the duration of a typical force measurement experiment. Cell viability was detected using a modified GFP protein that when transfected in the bacterial cells fluoresced only as long as the cells remained metabolically active. And you can see here on the bottom left is the fluorescence image showing the tip and the single bacteria cell in the end that's fluorescing green. And then on the right hand side there's an SCM image of the same tip where we see the uh, bacteria on the end. Researchers were also able to show that um, a variety of different types of bacteria cells were able to be immobilized in the, in the tip using this type of, uh, of uh, immobilization process. For the next part of my presentation, I'd like to discuss the latest advances in Bruker's AFM technology that are enabling new avenues of research in microbiology. First, I'll discuss the latest imaging mode, peak force tapping, as well as scan assist and peak force Q&M two new operational modes enabled by peak force tapping technology. <clears throat> Scan Assist is a self-optimizing imaging mode which significantly improves the consistency and ease of which one can obtain high resolution images of a sample. Peak force QNM, which stands for quantitative nanomechanical mapping, allows quantitative measurement nanometer scale mapping of mechanical properties of a sample, all with the typical scan rates and image resolution used for topography imaging. Next is the integration of AFM and optical microscopy with the Bioscope Catalyst and Moreau, image registration and overlay software. The functional integration of the catalyst with an inverted light microscope allows registration of the optical field of view to the AFM scan area, thereby allowing the use of optical images, such as bright field, phase contrast, or fluorescence, to navigate the AFM probe to regions of interest in a sample on which to conduct high-resolution correlative images as well as localized measurements or spatial mapping of the nanomechanical properties. Lastly, I'll present the latest advance in AFM technology, the FASTSCAN AFM system. FASTSCAN is an AFM imaging system that facilitates increased imaging rates in both air and fluid without compromising resolution or data quality. So let's start with peak force tapping. While STM and contact mode AFM have always been capable of routine, high-resolution imaging of polymers and conductive materials, it really wasn't until the invention of tapping mode that AFM became an amenable technique for imaging biological samples. The intermittent tip sample interactions of tapping mode eliminated the lateral shear forces and minimized the vertical forces of contact mode, actually making it possible to image soft bio biological samples without distorting or damaging them. And while tapping mode has repeatedly demonstrated its ability to provide high-resolution images of biomolecules and has really become the imaging method of choice for these types of samples, it does have some limitations. The nature of the tapping mode feedback loop, based on changes in the oscillation amplitude of the AFM tip operated as its resonance frequency, does not provide control or actual measurement of the tip sample interaction force. As such, while imaging parameters are typically optimized that these forces are minimized, one is never really sure of the actual forces you're applying to the sample surface, and we're unsure that we're actually applying the same imaging force across the entire sample surface. In addition, the instability of tapping mode dynamics and fluid has contributed to the reputation of high-resolution AFM imaging requiring the experience of an AFM expert rather than a routine application for novice or occasional users. Peak force tapping a revolutionary new AFM imaging mode exclusive to Bruker addresses these limitations of tapping mode imaging for high resolution imaging of biomolecules and biomolecular complexes. Peak force tapping allows direct control and measurement of the tip sample interaction force. Peak force tapping works by modulating the tip position vertically relative to a sample at a frequency that is below the cantilever resonance and typically between 1 to 2 kilohertz. The plot shown here on this slide on the left is force as a function of time. 
the, where the dashed line is the zero force rev reference established when the tip is not interacting with the sample. As the tip begins to approach the sample surface, it experiences attraction forces until it snaps into contact with the surface. After this initial uh, tip contact is established, short range reports pulse forces soon dominate the interaction and leading to the peak point at the approaching curve. When the tip begins to retract, it goes through an adhesion minimum and then becomes free of the sample surface. Peak force tapping refers to the control method that's used the instantaneous force at the peak of tip sample interaction for feedback control. Feedback recognizes the local peak force in the symbolic heartbeat pattern and uses the local maximum to control the imaging process. The corresponding interaction curve that's shown on the right-hand side is plotted as force as a function of z. It's essentially the same as a conventional force curve, but there are two major differences. In peak force tapping, the force curve is performed a few thousand times faster, and secondly, the peak force is two to three order magnitude more sensitive. As a result, peak force tapping images are acquired at similar scan rates to tapping mode, but imaging forces in peak force tapping can easily be um, about 10 times lower than typical imaging um, forces in tapping mode. It's also important to um, mention at this time that tapping mode or peak force tapping mode actually does not require the use of specialized AFM probes to conduct this type of imaging. Peak force tapping technology has facilitated scan assist mode, which is a self-optimizing imaging mode. Auto-optimization of parameters such as set point point gain and scan rate result in faster, more consistent imaging results regardless of the user level, skill level, while direct force control at ultra low forces protects delicate biological samples from distortion or damage from the tip. Scan assist also makes high resolution imaging and fluid dramatically easier. With the elimination of the need to tune the cantilever resonance, there's no need to worry about peak shifting. And with auto optimization of imaging parameters, the set point doesn't drift as often happens with traditional tapping mode operation in fluid due to dropping of amplitude over time. The use of very sharp probes, for example, scan assist fluid probes having a radius of curvature of about 2 nanometers, coupled with the ability to maintain optimal surface tracking over extended periods of time in fluid, um, not only provide the ability for routine high resolution studies of biomolecules, it really opens up opportunities for the observation of time-dependent dynamics without the loss of resolution. With peak force tapping and scan assist modes, the ability to acquire high resolution images, such as that shown here of a single herpes simplex virus, is more consistent and no longer heavily dependent on operator experience. This image of the herpes simplex virus particle is obtained using peak force tapping on the bioscope catalyst. The arrangement of protein molecules as three-dimensional subunits on the surface of the capsid, also known as capsomeres, is clearly visible in the AFM image. It is important to note that these virus particles were imaged as individually isolated particles. As virus capsids are very delicate, high-resolution images of their structure have typically been obtained using jumping mode AFM. Jumping mode is similar to peak force tapping mode in that discrete force curves are conducted along the fast scan axis and topography is derived from these force curves. However, peak force tapping can employ much lower imaging forces, which is very important for these types of sensitive samples. In other AFM studies of virus capture structures where tapping mode was successfully employed, the particles were typically arranged in a two-dimensional crystal structure. This 2D array provides the mechanical stability to the virus particles so they're not distorted or damaged under the force of the AFM probe. Peak force tapping also enables the next operational mode I'd like to describe, peak force Q&M, or quantitative nanomechanical property mapping. Because we're essentially collecting force curves at every pixel of the peak force tapping image, like traditional force curves, we can use these peak force generated curves to obtain quantitative nanomechanical property measurements as a function of spatial location over a sample surface. As a result, in addition to topographical data, Peak Force QNM simultaneously provides separate and individual quantitative two-dimensional maps of modulus, adhesion, dissipation, and deformation that directly correlate to the topography data channel and are acquired at typical pe pixel resolution required for high-resolution imaging and at typical imaging scan rates. It's also important to note that with this mode, material properties can be characterized over a wide range of samples to address many research areas. 
To examine the differences in the mechanical properties of live and dead bacteria cells, the Bioscope Catalyst was operated in peak force tapping mode to image the cell surface, while Moreau was used to register epifluorescence images to the AFM images of the cells. Bacteria were labeled with a fluorescent live dead assay. This assay allows determination of the viability of bacterial cells by labeling the intracellular DNA of live bacteria with a membrane permeant dye called Cyto9, which fluoresces green and labels the DNA of dead bacteria with a membrane impermeant dye, propidium iodide, which fluoresces red. The idea being that only the dead cells having a compromised membrane will be labeled with the membrane impermeant red fluorophore. Here we see a peak force error image of multiple bacteria cells. <clears throat> Excuse me. By AFM topography imaging alone, one cannot easily distinguish between a live and a dead cell. However, with the Moreau registered fluorescent images, shown here as an overlay of the red and green fluorescence data channels, we can easily and definitively identify the red fluorescing dead cell at the top of the image from the two live cells that are fluorescing green at the bottom of the image. One of, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> One of the really nice features of the catalyst is the ability to conduct optically guided force measurements, or point and shoot, in which we use an optical image to navigate the AFM probe to specific locations or regions of a sample surface to measure the local mechanical properties, such as modulus or elasticity measurements. In this case here, we're using a two-channel epifluorescence image to navigate the AFM probe, but one could use other types of optical images, such as bright field, phase contrast, DIC, confocal, or turf, just to name a few. Force curve measurements were performed at the locations indicated by the crosses in the fluorescence image. A representative curve from the dead cell shown in blue, the live cell in black, and the cell substrate in pink are shown on the graph on the right. The elasticity of a surface is represented in the slope of the contact portion of the force curve. We see here that the slope of the curve on the substrate is higher than that of the live cells, and that both are significantly higher than the slope of the dead cell indicating that the substrate has higher elasticity than the live cells, which in turn have higher elasticity than the dead cells. The difference in elasticity for the live and dead cells is not surprising as the compromised membrane of the dead cells would result in an inability to maintain cell normal or normal cell rigidity. One thing to note here is that the bacteria cells in this experiment were immobilized on a gelatin coated glass bottom petri dish. As such, the slope of the force curve performed in the substrate is representative of the elasticity of the gelatin layer rather than the underlying glass surface. This would explain why there is a smaller difference in the observed elasticity of the substrate versus the live cell than one might expect for a harder glass or polystyrene petri dish surface. <clears throat> Using peak force QNM, we were also able to map the nanomechanical properties across the surface of individual cells. Here we have the deformation and adhesion channels corresponding to the same cells in the peak force error and fluorescence images shown in the previous slides and shown here in the upper right corner. The deformation data channel reflects the deformation of the sample surface under the applied force of the AFM tip. Here the deformation image reveals the live cells, require, recall that they are the tube cells at the bottom of the image, have a fairly uniform deformation across the surface of the cells. The dead cell, however, the top right cell, appears more heterogeneous in deformation with definitive areas of increased deformation, uh, shown as green-yellow areas on the cell, which indicate softer or less elastic surfaces. What's nice is that this deformation data corresponds well to what we observed for the local elasticity measurements conducted on the cells in the previous slide. Recall that the live cells had higher elasticity than the dead cells. Interestingly, for some reason, the smaller cell in the upper left of the image was not labeled fluorescently in the live dead assay. While we were unable to determine if this was a viable cell in the fluorescence image, it would appear from the, appear from the deformation image that this would be a dead cell, having variable deformation across the surface of the cells with areas of increased deformation similar to the dead cell immediately next to it. While the deformation data channel showed distinct differences in live and dead cells, there would appear to be no difference in the, in the, adhesion, um, in the adhesion image on the right-hand side between the tip and the surface of the live or the dead cells. However, it would appear that there is higher adhesion between the tip and both types of cells than between the tip and the underlying gelatin-coated substrate. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> the Dimension FastScan AFM is Bruker's high-speed AFM imaging system and is the latest advance in AFM technology. The FastScan is developed on the Dimension ICON platform. With automation of significant portions of the experimental setup, FastScan facilitates increased imaging rates for tapping mode and peak force tapping in both air and fluid without added system complexity. The ability to obtain images on the order of seconds rather than minutes, as with traditional scan rates used for biological samples, significantly improves productivity without the loss of resolution or force control. Here we see a real-time view of the FastScan system imaging the two-dimensional crystal lattice structure of bacteria dopsin in fluid using peak force tapping. Imaging was conducted at 58 seconds per frame, where we can clearly see the structure of the individual bacteria dopsin molecules in this raw data. The larger variation in the topography that we see across the surface of the membrane within the scan frame is indicative of the membrane patch being more firmly attached to the underlying mica in some places than it is in others. Here we have the bacteria adoption data acquired from the real-time data in the previous slide after background subtraction. The two-dimensional FFT or fast Fourier transform shown in the upper right corner of the image reflects the hexagonal symmetry of the protein crystal. The spectrum shows good symmetry, indicating low distortion of the lattice structure. The inner maxima in the spectrum represent the lattice unit cell, while the outer maxima reflect the trimeric structure of bacteria adoption. This is consistent with the X-ray crystallography derived structure shown in the protein molecular model on the right for the zoomed area of the image. It is also important to note that the central pore of the bacteriodopsin molecules are well resolved in these images. High-speed imaging has also been applied to study the effects of antimicrobial peptides on live cells. Antimicrobial peptides, or AMPs, are naturally occurring small molecular weight molecules that are typically 50 amino acid residues or less. They are part of the innate immune response of all classes of life. With the increasing problem of antibiotic-resistant bacteria and the selectivity of AMPs for microbial cells, antimicrobial peptides are now being evaluated as an alternative therapeutic agent. As such, there is an increasing amount of research being conducted in order to gain an understanding of the mechanisms by which antimicrobial peptides attack and kill bacterial cells. Research has suggested various mechanisms activity for different AMPs. Several models, such as the barrel stave, troil pore, and carpet models, describe membrane disruption through the formation of pores or aggregate-induced mycelization of the membrane as a facilitator for cell death. Alternative models suggest that AMPs have cytoplasmic targets and bring about cell death through the disruption of core metabolic processes. In any case, for all these models, antimicrobial peptides must be able to transverse the cell membrane. CM15 is a synthetic hybrid antimicrobial peptide composed of the first seven residues of sequipin A and residues 2 to 9 of the B venom antimicrobial peptide melatonin. CM15 has been studied by various biophysical techniques. In fact, it has recently been examined by high-speed AFM and then studied by Fentner et al., um, whereby the increased time resolution of their AFM images allows them to observe the initial stages of CM15 activity on live E. coli cells. From the results of their AFM studies, they did propose a two-phase mechanism of antimicrobial peptide-induced cell death, consisting of an initial time-variable incubation phase then followed by a more rapid execution phase. In a similar study we have conducted here at Bruker, live E. coli cells were imaged on the FASTSCAN AFM system in tapping mode and fluid. In order to examine the effects of CM15 on cells, we introduced an aliquot of the antimicrobial peptide to the sample solution during continuous imaging of the cell surface at a final concentration of 10 micrograms per mil which is known to be the minimum inhibitory concentration for CM15. Consecutive images were acquired every 18 seconds. In the moving shown here of the data we collected, we see the dramatic changes in cell morphology induced by CM15. Consistent with previous microscopy studies, including SCM and AFM data, we observe an increase in the roughness or the corrugation of the bacterial cell surface. It's believed that these changes in roughness are a direct result of the incorporation of CM15 into the lipopolysaccharide-rich outer membrane of E. coli cells. E. coli are actually gram-negative bacteria. 
And for gram-negative bacteria, it's been proposed that antimicrobial peptides interact independently with the outer and the inner membranes, and that they must sequentially permeabilize first the outer membrane and then the inner membrane. The lethal consequences of antimicrobial peptide exposure, or cell death, is correlated specifically with perturbation of the inner membrane. Consistent with what Fontner and his group observed in their high-speed AFM study, we see here that the onset of the changes in the cell surface structure occur at different times for the three individual cells shown. First, the left bacteria cell is affected. Then in quick succession, we observe the right and the bottom bacteria to show the onset of morphological changes. Now, while previous AFM studies have shown similar changes in the gross morphology of bacterial cells in response to antimicrobial peptide exposure, being conducted at traditional scan rates, they're only able to capture consecutive images over long time intervals, more so on the order of minutes. Similar to what Fontner observed, we were able to demonstrate at increased time AFM time resolutions with the fast scan AFM system that we are now able to directly observe the dynamic effects of CM15 within seconds after exposure and detect the variations in the onset of these effects on individual cells at nanometer length scale. At traditional AFM scan rates, these initial interactions would typically not be detected. We then extended our fast scan AFM studies of antimicrobial peptide activity to high resolution imaging of the membrane surface of individual cells in an attempt to examine the local effects of CM15 on cell membrane structures. Shown on the bottom left of the slide is a 300 nanometer topography image of the native outer membrane surface of a single E. coli cell. In this image and the corresponding fast Fourier transform filtered images on the right, where this filtering is done to enhance periodic structures in the image, we clearly see membrane-associated structures that appear to resemble a bacteria S layer. As I mentioned earlier, an S layer is a self-assembled layer of identical proteins or glycoproteins that is associated with the surface of the bacterial cell membrane. Because of the soft nature and relatively rough surface of cells, direct imaging of native S layers by AFM is challenging. As such, AFS layers have typically been recrystallized as a two-dimensional lattice and imaged in model membranes or membrane patches that have been excised and absorbed onto a hard, flat substrate, as we previously described in this presentation, thus creating ideal conditions for high-resolution imaging of the lattice structure. Recently, Dupree reported AFM imaging of S layers on live bacteria, where the cells were grown under conditions that promoted the formation of crystalline patches of ordered S layer proteins. The S layer images on cells observed by Dupree do closely resemble the structures that we obtained with fast scan. While we do not clearly see the hexagonal lattice symmetry of the E. coli S layers, the resolution of our images are affected by the uneven surface of the structure of the cell, as well as the possibility that the extremely low elasticity of the cell may result in some distortion of the lattice structure by the AFM tip as it images over the cell surface. Now, if we observe the effects of antimicrobial peptides on the outer membrane of a bacteria cell at this image resolution, we see here that when cells are exposed to 20 micrograms per mil of CM15, which is twice the concentration we used previously, within seconds the membrane begins to increase in reference with the appearance of ripples and corrugations. The delay between CM15 exposure and the onset of the increase in roughness can be seen in the synchronized graph on the top. Interestingly, this increase in the membrane roughness is accompanied by the disappearance of the S-layer-like structures. We then see membrane protrusions start to form, which is consistent with blebbing or vesicle formation, followed by the appearance of pore-like lesions in the membrane surface, about 15 nanometers in diameter. While others have seen the formation of similar lesions being the same or larger in size by CM15, we do not necessarily believe them to be a single pore, as single pores have previously been shown by other techniques to be about 2 to 3 nanometers in size. The images in this data set were captured at a rate of 8 seconds per frame, with the entire sequence of events taking place over a period of 358 seconds. Again, this really demonstrates the advantage of fast scan being able to conduct AFM imaging at scan rates that are relative to cellular processes whereas at typical AFM scan rates, the majority of the events observed here would have occurred before a single AFM image could be captured. 
to make sure that the morphological changes we observed at high resolution were not induced by the local motion of the AFM tip, we imaged the entire E. coli cell before and after exposure to CM15. It is clear from the images shown here that similar changes, including membrane blebbing, occurred over the entire cell surface, and thus were not likely tip-induced. We also decreased, observed a decrease in the size and the volume of the cell as measured by the bearing analysis function in the nanoscope analysis software. Recall that at lower concentration of CM15, we mainly observed an increase in the roughness of the cell surface, reflecting incorporation of CM15 molecules into the outer cell membrane. Here, with a higher concentration of CM15, the initial increase in outer cell membrane roughness is then followed by cell shrinkage, which is, which is associated with the leakage of cytoplasmic material, and then membrane blebbing, which is associated with the onset of cell death. These observations are indicative of CM15 having sequentially permeabilized the outer membrane and then the inner cell membrane and is now at or near the final stages of its mechanism for cell death. So, in summary, um, I really hope that in today's presentation I've successfully conveyed that AFM is increasingly being used to study various microorganisms and that in these studies AFM has provided unique insights into the structural and physical properties of microbial cell surfaces as well as provide unique opportunities to examine the dynamics of cellular processes in real time and in situ. And finally, that the latest advantages in AFM technology from Bruker such as the Bioscope Catalyst with Moreau image registration software, Scan Assist and Peak Force Q&M imaging modes, and the Fast Scan High Speed AFM system are now creating new avenues of research in microbial studies. So with that, um, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, here I'm just putting up a slide now with my contact information. Um, we're going to move now to the question and answer. Um, Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, address some of the questions here uh, that we've had today uh, for Andrea. So the first question, uh, does peak force tapping and scan assist technologies help overcome the challenges of immobilizing microbes on a surface? Um, peak force tapping does indeed help um, in, in um, improving the ability to maintain um, cells on the surface. Um, it does use lower res uh, imaging forces, so you would have less distortion. Um, but at the same time, um, the high-speed AFM imaging that we conducted with the uh, fast scan system was conducted in tapping mode and uh, using the um, gelatin-coated surface layers, um, we were able to sufficiently immobilize those cells. Um, the main thing with peak force tapping is um, it does significantly, and we've shown it in several studies, improve the resolution that you do achieve. Um, and that, I guess, in some sense could be due to um, better immobilization on the surface. Okay. Uh, the next question uh, is, is it possible with the Bruker AFMs to simultaneously collect force spectroscopy data and topography data uh, of the interaction sites, or are you limited to mapping just the interaction uh, while collecting the force curves? Um, so I guess in that sense, um, if you're doing peak force tapping or peak force tap, um, tapping Q&M, your um, surface property um, maps or data channels are acquired simultaneously to your topography. So if you did, for example, use a functionalized probe, you could get simultaneous um, images of topography as well as um, you know, maps that represent the interaction forces between the, whatever's on your tip and the surface. Um, so yeah. Okay, uh, the next question. Uh, is it possible to use tapping mode to collect images of the surface of a leaf uh, mounted uh, on a mica surface and to look at the morphology uh, of the surface cells and then also the mechanical properties of the leaf tissue surfaces? Of a leaf? That's interesting. I've never actually looked at a leaf. Um, I do know that um, people have looked at um, plant roots, plant stems um, by AFM, so I can't see why that would not be possible. I mean, you know, we've, we've looked at everything from, you know, cells to hard substrate surfaces, so I'm sure that would kind of fall somewhere in between. I guess the main thing would be figuring out a, a mobilization procedure for the leaf. 
Okay, uh, the next question. Uh, have you studied protein structures like carboxysomes, which arrange in hexagonal lattices uh, with a spacing of about five to six uh, nanometers? And if so, what sample preparation would you recommend? Uh, what instrument and uh, what imaging mode? Uh, he says he has both a, a multi mode and a dimension 3000. So I'm uh, unfortunately going to have to plead ignorance on what a carboxysome is. Um, so they form hexagonal lattices. Um, so I will just take a stab at, I'm, I, as I said, I'm not sure what a carboxysome is, but um, as I showed in this um, presentation, uh, there were several examples where um, 2D crystalline lattices were, were examined um, by AFM. Um, if it's something that's in a membrane or in some sort of flat structure, it can be immobilized, say, on a, a mica surface or a silicon surface. And that's done by optimizing um, the ionic strength in the buffer solution. Um, but if, if I'm unfortunately misinterpreting what a carboxysome is, please feel free to um, contact me. My email address is actually up on the screen. I'd be happy to discuss sample preparation with you. All right, uh, the next question. So for the imaging of the bacteria, what probe spring constant you, did you use for both the, the conventional and then the high-speed imaging? Um, so in both cases, um, the spring constant of the probes were about 0.3 newtons per meter. Um, it was a different type of tip um, used. Um, for example, in the fast scan, we use small cantilevers that have higher um, uh, frequencies for operation, but the spring constant of the tip is effectively the same. Okay, uh, next question. How readily were you able to image in the growth media, and do you have any suggestions on uh, what to avoid? That's actually an interesting question, um, and I didn't really state it, but we did not conduct our imaging in growth media. Um, and, and that's actually been brought up in several examples from when you're looking at bacteria. Um, the thing we're trying to do is we are using electrostatic interactions, so the bacteria has an overall negative charge, and so we're creating a positive charge on the surface to immobilize the cells. And because there's so many different types of thing in growth medium, the nutrients and whatnot and, and cellular wastes, um, they actually will compete for binding sites on the surface of the polylysine or the gelatin. So you actually have to rinse the cells um, in water um, before uh, you actually immobilize them on the surface. Um, so if you did want to Im uh, image them in growth media, the trapping or mechanical trapping in the pores is actually a good I uh, idea. And there was um, actually recently a, a paper by um, Rick and Meyer um, out of Aarhus where they were looking at different methods of um, physical confinement of individual cells for looking at more physiologically relevant um, conditions where you could image in growth media. Um, in our case, we did image in, in water, so you have to be careful that you know you're not having osmotic uh, changes in your cells. So in all cases of our images, we image the cells over extended periods of time to make sure that being in water did not change the surface of the cells. So the, so that the changes we were looking when the antimicrobial peptides were present were actually due to the microbial peptides and not the fact that they were in, in water. Okay, uh, the next question we have, uh, can tapping mode be used to study malaria-infected red blood cells? Why, well, yeah, actually it, it can, and there is a paper, unfortunately I don't know the reference off the top of my head, um, but I can probably email it to you, but there is actually a published paper um, that they used um, peak force um, tapping, peak force Q&M, to um, map the binding interactions between these um, protrusions on the surface of malaria-infected cells and a molecule that's on the end of the tip. And they did find um, you know, binding sites across the surface. So we'd be happy to get you that reference. OK, uh, the next question for point-and-shoot for spectroscopy, does Bricker use closed-loop feedback, or is optical guidance adequate? No, uh, so everything is conducted in, in feedback, so, uh, sorry, in closed loop. So um, 
when you're in open loop, you know, you, you have the optical image and you can use it to guide the AFM probe, but the accuracy at the offsetting is dependent on using the closed loop um, AFM um, scan. So it's, it's closed loop XY, and in terms of force measurements, we're using closed loop Z. Uh, the next question, uh, what were the velocity ranges that you used in the force curves, uh, both for approach and reach act uh, on the bacteria? Um, so the force curves uh, were conducted at, I believe it was either half hertz or one hertz. Um, and I think we looked, um, I'm not sure what we showed, but I think we looked at both of those rates. Okay. Um, when you're uh, calculating the elastic modulus of the cell membrane, what part of the force curve do you use, and uh, what probe spring constant do you use? Um, so typically cells have a very low um, modulus, so you want to use as soft um, a probe as possible. Typically, um, you know, when you're looking at force curves on, on cells, people use um, probes that have spring constants of about 0 0.01 newton per meter, give or take. Um, and the portion of the curve that you're actually looking at for modulus is the contact portion. So um, if I just see if I can go back here to find a force curve. So bear with me a second. Just to bring up a force curve here. There we go. So if you look at the force curves here and see if I can get my cursor to work, um, the tip comes in from uh, non-contact, approaches the sample surface where we have contact, and then we see this increase in the slope. So this is the contact area here, and this is the area that we actually derive the modulus from. And in fact, if we go back to look at the peak force Q&M, you can see here um, that this is the area that in peak force Q&M we're deriving the modulus. So it's when the tip is actually in contact um, with the surface. And so you're looking at how the um, surface resists the uh, force or the applied force of the AFM probe. Okay, uh, the next question, uh, is it possible uh, with the Bricker AFMs to uh, collect images with uh, 10,024 pixels per line and 256 lines uh, instead of 256 by 256 or 1024 by 1024. Yep, you actually can. And all of the um, fast, well, the majority of the fast scan data we showed for the movies were actually collected at 1024 by 256. So you can do non-square pixel images. Mm -hmm. All right, we have time for just a couple more uh, questions. Uh, next one, uh, how do you measure the pull-off forces with functionalized probes? Um, so again, if we, just to show you the example of the curve here, when you're looking at pull-off forces, you're now looking at the adhesion uh, well. So um, first of all, you would have a calibrated probe so that you know that for a given deflection, you would know the force that's associated with that amount of deflection. So when you're looking at um, binding interactions, we're actually looking at unbinding. So you would actually look at this adhesion well, and you would look at the delta between the maximum adhesion um, down here and the pull-off. So we look at the amount of force required to pull the tip free of the sample surface. Okay, and then uh, there are several questions about how does peak force Q&M uh, measure the modulus of the sample since it's not a contact mode technique, uh, since the, the interaction depends just on the deflection and the spring constant. Sorry, that was a question. <laughs> This is this one right here. Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't understand the question. Sorry, Ben. Do you? Yeah. So I, I think the maybe the the misunderstanding here is that although uh, peak force Q and M is not a uh, a contact mode technique, it is intermittently making contact with the sample. Mm -hmm. So uh, as Andrea was showing uh, in her presentation, well, actually just uh, here on this slide, uh, peak force Q and M is measuring force curves very quickly as it scans across the surface. So each one of those mechanical interactions can be analyzed to extract uh, modulus information as well as adhesion and dissipation and deformation.
All right. Well, I think that's it. Uh, we don't have uh, any other questions here uh, that we can uh, address today. Um, just a reminder then, uh, as you finish, uh, you'll receive an invitation to participate in a brief survey, so please do take a look at that. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, you have uh, Andrew's contact information there, and uh, we would be happy to, uh, to talk to you further. Uh, so with that, thank you very much uh, for attending the webinar today, and uh, please join us again uh, at a future webinar. Thank you.